KPPPLP Fargo Moorhead 88.1 FM. Welcome to Finding Me, our final part for the month of November. Um, we're going to start on Chapter 3 and um, talk about that a little, at least. Um, I'm going to read a lot from it, and then I'm just going to kind of give you my thoughts as they come to me in relation to uh, queer fandom and uh, how that works with sides creating propaganda of one or the other side, etc. So... Chapter 3 here is titled, The Representation of Homosexuality in the Print Media in Slovenia. So here we're going to compare and contrast to uh, compare the scenarios of who says what and why. Before we embark on discourse analysis to show the how media construct the homosexual as a stigmatized social subject, we will examine this discourse in relation to the historical context in which it appears, since a discourse cannot exist outside history. In presenting this historical cross-section, we will highlight these events that influenced, in some way or another, media reporting on homosexuality. As we shall see, homosexuality usually becomes visible and finds its way onto the media agenda when it is perceived as a scandal. This was not only confirmed in Slovenia by the media attention accorded to homosexuality thanks to a series of scandals that dotted the 1980s and 1990s, but was also exploited by some Western gay and lesbian movements. Here we have, in many primarily, the activist group Queer Nation, which I talked about way back in, I think it was either February or January. I'll have to go back, but I will link that into uh, the related content section of my uh, blog post on kppfm.com. So, let's see. As a political tactic for attaining visibility in all spheres of public life, and not only in the media. Uh, in the next step, we will present a basic statistical analysis of the collected material and then proceed to analyze the elements of rhetorical structures. The concluding part will delineate the five general principles underpinning the media construction of homosexuality, which I talked about in the earlier part when I was covering this way back um, in September for the five things stereotyping medicalization, sexualization, secrecy, and normalization. Those five. Um, so section one um, is early discussions on homosexuality. So here they talk about the first paper newspaper article that touched upon the issue appears as early as 1921 in the Nijva magazine, spelled N-J-I-V-A. In it, the anonymous author urged the repeal of an article of the then-law penalizing every act by which the offender sought or found sexual satisfaction in the body of a person of the same sex. The first reference to homosexuality was followed by a Samizdat publication five years later, an essay titled Homosexualnost, which is translation from homosexuality, more than 30 pages in length and signed by Ivan Podolsnik, writing under the pseudonym Vindex. His pioneering work, which mainly draws on the ideas and writings of the German author Magnus Hirschfeld, was written, much like the newspaper article mentioned above, in support of homosexuality and people of this kind of sexual orientation. Pottlesnake's work strikes one as a therapeutic piece, among other reasons, also because, in conclusion, it offers advice to homosexual men and women. 
Among the other things, Pottlesnick encouraged them not to feel unhappy. Quote, Before the Supreme Judge, their conscience, they are innocent, and the more others consider them guilty, the more innocent they are. They will also overcome their feelings of isolation once they realize that many people throughout history and the world have shouldered the burden of the same destiny. Above all, they should not overlook the fact that their properly understood homosexual love may reward them with the purest kind of happiness, just like any other love, despite the fact that many people disdain it. By making others happy through their homosexual love, they become happy themselves. Through the uplifting of their bodies and souls, the love endows them with so much good that their shouldering of some pain is worthy of it. After all, neither are heterosexuals spared the bitter drops of the intoxicating love potion. And that's the end of the quote. The liberal spirit radiating from these first written references to homosexuality in Slovenia was soon offset by opposing voices mainly coming from those authors who considered homosexuality unnatural and, in accordance with the views of the medical science of the time, labeled it as a disease, i.e. psychological disorder. A translation of the work orientation towards the same sex by the Dutch essayist Van Orchingen was published in 1937. The very rendering of the title in Slovene, Protinarovna Jud, Unnatural Disposition, by the translator signed S.K., exacerbated Orchingen's position which aimed to present homosexuality as unnatural. In the foreword to Slovene translation, S.K. explained that this kind of sexual abuse was widespread among Slovenes, as it was in other European countries, with the exception of Germany, which had been successfully purged of such anomalies by Adolf Hitler when he rose to power. Because of genocide. After the Second World War, the issue of homosexuality continued to be primarily the subject of psychological and psychiatric studies and practically absent from public media discourse. Official psychiatry and medicine treat homosexuality as a psychological disorder. For example, in a book entitled Pastoralna Physiologica, Pastoral Psychology, published immediately after the Second World War in 1946, Anton Tristanjak referred to homosexuals as sexual psychopaths. In his opinion, a homosexual person was a representative of the psychopath of the fanatic type dangerous to mankind. The same statement reappeared in the second revised edition of Pastoral Psychology, published in 1987. The medicalization of homosexuality would become, as we shall see later, the pivot of media representations of homosexuality throughout the 1970s. It would also partly persist in the 1980s and 1990s when the medical discourse was generally taken over and replaced by the human rights discourse. Section 1.1, the 70s. Now, this one was really interesting to me because I wanted to then, um, well, I'll get to it, actually. So, the first decade of the period analyzed here, i.e. 1970-1980, was characterized by the silence of the print media on this issue, and probably the mass media in general. It was only interrupted by sporadic personal ads that began to appear in Nadel Jivsky's Divnik Daily and the Antenna Weekly, Towards the end of the 60s, from men seeking male friends, somewhat more media space was dedicated to the discussion about the second paragraph of Article 168 of the Penal Code, according to which every, quote, unnatural act of unchastity between persons of the male sex was a criminal offense. Although the Penal Code did not mention any such type of unchastity among women, this should not be interpreted as a sign of liberal approach to homosexuality among women. The invisibility of women's love was actually a consequence of the patriarchal understanding of sexuality and love, according to which sexual relations between women was less problematic, or owing to the absence of the male sexual organ, even considered impossible and therefore non-existent. So, in plain English, generally speaking, just because they didn't talk about lesbianism expressed in um, that writing doesn't mean that it was approved. And um, I think about this in the context of fandom when uh, we have, like, like obviously there's a lot of things made for the male gaze in, like, uh, for example, pornography. And a lot of queer people want to see something that is uh, goes up against that, you know, for themselves to enjoy 
because so they can, you know, feel like regular people that also do the same thing that heterosexual people do. Um, or how, like, especially for queer women, it's difficult to find something that appeals to them that wasn't written um, f- with the male gaze in mind or something that they can relate to. Because oftentimes, even with uh, uh, content that involves women having sex with other women, uh, it's done with that male gaze in mind and it doesn't uh, indulge women's desires, especially queer women's desires. And, uh, for example, with, like, uh, the culture of, uh, for example, Fujoshi in Japan, they indulge in uh, the genre of yaoi or boys' love to uh, distance themselves from their gender and experience uh, those desires in a different way. And uh, for us in the West, I mean, there's that too, but also, uh, or the um, taking on of that label as well to fit in with that feeling and how uh, not only that, but because there's so much uh, lack of women loving women media that oftentimes we just go for what's plenty around, which is the men loving men media that is available. So, and along with that, it's a lot of how um, some trans men in queer fandom tend to uh, find themselves uh, when they're trans like for me you know I read a lot of manga and then I started like going into fan works because I liked you know, seeing like for example you know because I was a kid I liked you know watching and reading Pokemon and uh, playing the games and then when I got older and I was allowed to go on the internet I would look up pictures and artwork of Pokemon and that would be cool and like I had a deviant art back in the day so I would add that work and then you know as my interests um broadened in horizons and everything um i got into other stuff and then it occurred to me while i was reading some fan works that you know because i've talked to you about shipping culture and fandoms and shipping culture and uh ships in general so that was when it first occurred to me that i could ship a man with a man and women with women and that was cool and that was fine and it just never occurred to me that there could be anything else um, like, for example, like, uh, in Kingdom Hearts fandom, the obvious choice is to ship Sora with Kairi because they've been best friends for a while, and it's generally implied. But there's also people who ship uh, Sora and Riku, who also have a stronger bond, if not a strong, the strongest bond of the series, and is strangely even marketed as somewhat romantic, um, which I think is hilarious considering that I don't think that would ever happen. Um, in the canon, the written canon, but uh, I'm diverging a little. But a lot of people, at least women, enjoy men loving men content. Even you know, just because not only because that's all there really is all the time, but because uh, it's just something they enjoy, and they don't really have to explain that. Just like you don't have to explain, you know, why you do things the way you do them, as long as nobody's getting hurt because of it. And so um, I think about that in terms of uh, controlling, uh, like, for example, recently, uh, Tumblr website, now you can't search the yaoi um, search term, but you can look up the uh, yuri search term. And what happens is that oftentimes yuri is mostly geared towards uh, the male gaze, and it doesn't satisfy the needs and desires of women who have been on the website for a while and uh fujoshi people um they when when they use the label they've already been given so much flack about their uh indulgence in that form of media so much so that you know people say really awful things even though uh, if you want to be like a true feminist, then you're going to respect a woman's choice to indulge in whatever she likes. If she, you know, we talk about like uh, if a woman wants an abortion, that's her choice. And if she does want to keep the baby, that's also her choice. But, you know, that's her. And so if a woman wants to sexually express herself a certain way through media, whether it's indulging in uh, 
uh, men loving men fiction, romance, and erotica content, then that's also her choice, and you should not shame her for it, um, and vice versa. As long as no one's getting hurt, because that's you know that's the big point. And you know there is a thing called sensitivity reading. So if you really wanted to have the input of queer men in media and their uh, the way they're portrayed, then yeah, you could talk to me, for example, because I'm a queer man. Um, you can talk to other uh, men, loving men, gay men, bisexual men, biromantic men. You know the whole spectrum of men who love other men. And uh, then you could like sensitively read and write and. Uh, portray that in a more positive way that all could enjoy but no one actually talks about that as a real solution and decides no you just can't have it and it becomes a bit of a uh um it just demonizes the behavior and shames them so yeah that's that's what i have to say on that thank you and we'll have another show next week in december did you find yourself today while finding me feel free to send me a message. You can contact us at 701-566-0917, at Nemo Potatoes on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Contact me through my contact on kppfm.com forward slash finding dash me on that tab, or email me at nemo at kppfm.com. If you'd like a sneak peek to the building of Finding Me programs in the future, consider becoming a patron at my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash anemonefish. Follow us on Facebook at 88.1 FM Fargo-Moorhead, The People's Press Project, and Mexi-Can. Donations to Fargo-Moorhead's newest low-power commercial-free radio station can be made at our website on kpppfm.com forward slash donate and check out our underwriting opportunities at kpppfm.com forward slash underwriting dash opportunities on how you can support the first queer radio program in the Red River Valley. Thanks for tuning in. See you next month on the first Wednesday here on Finding Me. 